Yes, in the first instance. And then over time, if you get the processors owning the quota or people who live in Sydney and own a bit of quota from down the you might be removing that stewardship away from the people who are actually doing the fishing because you've become at least you're you're basically renting the place. You're not. So that debate. I mean, as as Beth said, I'm, I'm trying to formulate a paper and they they sort of accept it on the basis that I get some more data to prove it. So, but it's which is not easy, of course. But um, so I I would think that. Automatic stewardship from owning the property right is not maybe so automatic. I mean, yeah. yeah but you probably have a bit of yeah. opinion about that, yeah. Well, I, I usually have I teach classes at UBC that is probably completely uh, interdisciplinary people. And this year, this last January, I had a lawyer, a political scientist in the class, and that made the class really I talked about the stewardship thing with ITQs, and the lawyer said, Are you sure about this? He said, Get out of here. I told him, This is the receipt theory, and so on. He said, Just think of it this way. If you own your own house, right, and something gets spoiled in the house, you can decide not to fix it, and nobody will come after you, right? But if you are renting and you destroy something, somebody is going to come after you, and you will have to fix it. And actually, this guy made my head spin, right? Because he quickly took me to my own house and said, Indeed, we have things hanging there for, for years and we haven't fixed it. If it was somebody else, I would have to fix it. So, so you get the point. So the lawyer simply kind of hit me. This is what you don't get in the conventional economics club because they all swallow the theory. Right? Yeah, yeah. This guy said, No, 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 let's think about this. Yeah. So, yeah. So, but there's a fine if you don't change an asset. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of a fine, like you don't get your bond back if you don't yeah, clean yeah, the house up. Yeah, it's just saying that the rules, the regulations you have yeah. probably would work better than ownership. That's why he's saying. Yeah, yeah that's just perfect in that. Yeah. Wow. Do the quota owners have any type of uh, environmental responsibility that is monitored somehow? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you own a quota, are you responsible for? Um, you know, preserving the, uh, the system that you're exploiting, to some degree. Well, there's two ways of answering that question. I suppose there's some ways that, that, that policymakers can ensure some sustainable usability, additional to uh, the total level of catch. They can what they call input control, so they can say you can only fish with a certain type of net to reduce your bite catch, or you're only allowed to fish in this area at this time of the year because the fish are spawning it. You can only take females of a certain size after they've spawned. So you can put additional controls on fishery, which additional to the, the, the quota system that would ensure um, higher sustainability in that fishery, um, which is which would be compulsory. But in terms of voluntary, I I don't I, I think we, we're sort of relying on that stewardship <coughs> behaviour to to uh, achieve that. So my question is, do they get in trouble? Eventually, or yeah. I mean, if you own a quota, let's say you, you, you have a quota for 40 years, <coughs> but you are you know, exhausting it really, really quickly, that system is not going to recover mm -hmm. well, you quite for the next 30 years. It's an annual number. It's an annual number, but you can. And you don't buy the rights for, for a decade, for instance. No, yeah, I don't think so. Sometimes it's forever, actually. Mm -hmm. But your question is very uh, valid because it doesn't automatically mean that people don't cheat in quota systems. They do hybrid, they discount, because you want to fill your boat with valuable fish, right? If you catch quite high, that will be throw it down. So there are lots of things that go on. And many of the quota systems that have worked well, they have very strong monitoring and control systems. In fact, they have, in some cases, they have two people on each boat going out to monitor what they do in BC. For it to work, so it's not a given. You need a lot of uh, enforcement. Yeah. Well, yeah. And the nice thing is, when they have this thing, sometimes they contribute to the enforcement. In the media, they actually fund the whole enforcement thing. You know, the, the industry pays to, to pay for those who go with the devil. So. I guess you can intuitively explain it. Like if you owned quota, you owned 100 tons of quota, and you 
you have a son who was wanting to go fishing or a daughter that wanted to go fishing as well, you want to make sure that that, that fish doesn't get exhausted or that the, 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 the fishery is sustainable because you want to pass it on. If there's no, if the fishery is unsustainable, those 100 tonnes of quota, which might, if you were selling it on the market today, might give you half a million dollars, if there's no fish, it's worth nothing. So you have some incentive to keep the value of your quota in case you want to sell it in the future sometime. So again, that would suggest that you're going to look after what's there. But the truth is that it's, it, it, yeah, it's, it's not always the case. It's not really what we're saying. Theory would suggest that that would be. So can I hear it?
goes in visually in camera <laughs> and actually decide what is actually occurring. And they say that would make a lot of the social and economic interest, you know. So that's a catch for some things, the things you're talking about. And if you think of the Mediterranean tuna, the Mediterranean Sea, there has been clear evidence where the scientific recommendation is not followed. Politicians always recommend something higher. And not only that, and this has been described in the literature as a management failure, right? Because they don't follow the scientific thing for other reasons. It may be good reason, whatever, but they don't. And it's always more than scientific. <laughs> and not only that, after they've done that, the actual catching is also higher than, than the official quota. So you have implementation failure, where for various reasons people overcatch their whole pages. And this is very common. The latest one is Namibia. The scientists recommended something, and the minister came up with something 50% more this year. This year. So this is really. Yeah, it has reasons for that. The industry needs to keep going on you know, the economic and social science. Hi. What is the welfare gains or losses of this change? To go from random to escape in this case? Are there welfare losses or gains? And who which group loses and the do you have any study on that? Because that would be actually really interesting things to see how these structural change. Individuals so. I, I, I don't have any information on that, but yeah, no, that's something that's it. I, I'm sure, but you, you know any studies that have looked at the welfare gains and losses from changing structures in, in fisheries or changing ownership uh, structures? Or? The welfare gains are the economic gains. Yeah, there are studies that have shown that, and it's positive actually. But for efficiency who? gains? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, 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 it's a for, 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 for the so called more efficient fisheries. Who are able to buy off. And so for them, for all the ones that are out of this okay. You know, yeah, that this is on the small scale, the small ones usually do sell it because they are those who, who are willing to sell, you know, to sell the quota. Uh, they lose your quota, you have some money, but what do you do with the money is another thing. Now, there's this quote I saw in the newspaper from Haiti. The uh, power plant wanted to sell <coughs> something and they bought off farmers, they paid them. And a few years after, the farmers uh, all broke, right? The money, who knows where the money, maybe to buy a hotel gene or something, right? So they broke, and one of the, one of the farmers was quoted in the New York Times, and he said, the problem with cash is that it has no roots. When you get it, in you spend it, it just goes. But when you have your farm, at least every year you can get something. It's realized enough after collecting the money, right? So this is what you see in many quota fisheries. The small people just get bought out of it. Because of all. But it seems like it can be bought. Hmm? It seems that what drives the system is that it's all in pieces. You can't sell a quota. Okay. That's how it seems to yeah. Are know. they mostly leases or do they sell? This is only the lease market. I'm not sure. Ah, it's yeah. no, yeah. no, okay. not okay. Okay. So if it's a lease, I think that's probably a good way to deal with it. That's true. You can have sales. Uh, it's like most Australian markets, though, you very rarely get a sale because it's so much more expensive than leasing. So what tends to happen is you either get the kind of pattern you see here or you get informal gentleman's agreements that I'm not selling my quota to Ingrid, but I will permanently, I will lease it to her every year. And it's just on the back of a handshake. One of the things, and then I'll just be the last, I suppose, one of the things that's interesting in Australia is that because of buying quota is almost unaffordable in profitable fisheries, the young fishermen can't afford to come into the fishery so, because they can't buy the quota. So a lot of those guys who are leasing quota are young fishermen because they can't afford to buy. And so the ones that I talk to, they say, well, by the time I retire, I will be able to afford to buy them because they're never going to be able to afford it while they're fishing. So, and the banks won't then so you're getting a demographic shift in the fishery as well, where the, guy, the young guys are basically working really hard, and a lot of them play hard now because they can earn $500 a day in the oil and gas industry. So there's some demographic, important demographic changes. So what will happen might be the same as on the land, where in Australia a lot of old landowners that produce 80% of the wheat haven't got anyone to 
do their farming after they retire because their sons are out being lawyers in Sydney. Yeah. So there's no one to take over the, the agricultural production either. And, and the same is happening in fisheries. 